Just like the man who is cascading rants on Have I Got News For You make the television licence fee seem like a bargain. <laughs> but the man of words was inspired by the silent world of Chaplin, Keaton, Laurel and Hardy and the rest. Silent Comedy is the title of his new book. Welcome, Paul Merton. <laughs> Fred Astaire. Yeah, exactly. I'm oh, Lionel Blair. Yeah, I'm here to see you off the premises. <laughs> <laughs> well, you started it, of course, ten years ago, didn't you? When we came back to the BBC, you were my first guest. Yes, I was thrilled to be doing that and thrilled to be doing this, so it's Thank marvellous. You, Thank you for having me. Oh, you uh, saw me on and you've seen me off now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, now, this new book of yours, uh, Silence yes. Comedy, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a homage mm. to your, to the inspiration you gain, of course, from but reading it, I mean, it seems like when you were a kid that you were trained to be a projectionist rather than a comic. Well, I got into the sort of, I was very interested in comedy from an early age and, and I started seeing these people, Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin, on, on television. But it wasn't until I went to go and see them live that I actually, or to see the films live, as it were, on a big screen with a live musician. And suddenly I, I realised the magic of silent comedy is still there. The best of them are still as good as they always were, but you've got to see them in the right environment. They get a sort of a bum rap because you sometimes see them on TV in, yes. in dodgy prints with the wrong music, and mm. TV's a sort of screen that size. They've got to be seen on the, the big screen. But when they were, in, were they inspiration in the sense that you said, I want to be like that? Yes, definitely. I mean, I saw the Buster Keaton film The General when I was about 13 years old in a, a cinema on Oxford Street, and I, just, I was just knocked out by the fact this film was funny, and it was 50 years old at that point, and it struck me as a kind of immortality, you know? That mm. the, yes. something, to, the, to make a piece of work or a piece of art, a, a piece of comedy that still sustains 50 years later, I thought that was absolutely wonderful. Because, I mean, if you looked at, at Keaton's work, I mean, the famous dead pal, mm. the stone, mm. stone face, it was called. Yes. I mean, it's possible to see the, his influence in your appearances, and have I got news for you? Yes, I, to a certain extent. I think one of the first things I did as a stand-up comedian was this, this uh, routine about a policeman who'd been given hallucinogenic drugs without his knowledge. And so he was, he was just sort of giving the evidence in court in a very deadpan way. And I noticed that if he said things like... Uh, uh, 35 minutes later, I spotted Constable Parrish approaching me disguised as a fortnight's holiday in Benidorm. <laughs> so if you say that with a straight face, it's funnier than if you're just sort of, you know, jollying it up. And also on Have I Got News For You, I think that uh, sometimes you can say something that's funny and you want to laugh him, but if you don't look as if you know what the joke is yourself, you can, you can get an extra laugh. <laughs> you say in your book, when you talk about that, doing that policeman, that, that was the first time at the comedy store, yes. that you actually got a laugh and got the confidence maybe to think I can make a living out of this. Yes, because it was the, I, I worked at the civil service for a couple of years and I wanted to, to leave to become, you know, trying to become a comedian. But of course, when you've got an ambition like that, um, you might get to that terrible truth where you find out you can't do it. Yes. But you've got to try. And yes. so that was holding me back. I thought, well, what's the suppose if I try and I, and I find it's, I'm one of those people who had the ambition but didn't have the talent. So that put me off for a while, but I was very lucky to get that second gig went so well. It was only three and a half minutes or whatever, but it went so well that it got me through every bad gig for 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> I, used, I used to have an act that started brilliantly and just used to descend really rapidly. <laughs> I couldn't live up to my own material. <laughs> and you also say in the book that you had, after that, you had a Chaplin moment. Going yes. across Westminster Bridge. Yes, I did, yes. There was, the Comedy Store then was a sort of a, a, a divey sort of place in Soho, uh, back in sort of 1982, I think. And, yes, this was such a moment for me, because to have the ambition to be a comedian, to want to be a funny person, to want to make people laugh, and then, having done it, was just extraordinary. So early on, I walked back all the way from Soho to Streatham, where I had lived in a bedsit at the time, on a, just a cloud of joy. It was just a, you know, and I looked, I stood on the, 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 the Westminster Bridge and looked down into the river and just sort of thought, just, I, my head was just spinning. Big Ben was showing at half past three in the morning. It was probably a sort of cold uh, spring day. And I was just, I was, it was like I was just really literally ecstatic. Yes. With joy. And I found out later on that Chaplin himself had done a gig, uh, done reasonably well at a gig, and he'd crossed the same bridge and looked down into the river, and that sort of gave me a nice little connection with him, you know. Mind you, you even with a best city in Streatham, you were certainly several degrees higher up the social ladder than Chaplin was, because yes. he was born into 
extreme poverty, wasn't he? Yes, well, he's, initially, yes, his parents were sort of musical acts, and uh, in the days before, you, d you, know, you didn't have amplification, you didn't have PA system, so somebody would be singing in a, in a music hall, and Charlie's mother was a singer, and she'd have, like, a four-piece band in front of her, and she got a very bad attack of laryngitis. Her voice started to go in the middle of this act, and uh, the audience that had previously been on her side started booing her, and, and, and she was, fell into tears, and Charlie, who was five years old, was sort of brought on the stage manager said, well, put him on, he'll do some sort of fun, you know, some funny stuff. He'd seen him sort of, you know, playing around. So Charlie went on and started doing impressions and imitations and, and loved every moment of it, you know, and that was when his career was born. But his mother, she never went back on the stage after that and no social services, no welfare state. She, they got poorer and poorer and they ended up being taken into the Lambeth workhouse. And then he became, of course, one of the richest men in the world. Yes. In, in entertainment. That's yes. Certainly, I mean, a yes. huge amounts of money he earned in the, what, 20s and 30s? 20s and 30s, so much so nobody else in Hollywood has ever done what he did, which in the end he made films of his own money. Yes. You know, <laughs> yeah. he literally made them yeah, with his own money. Yeah. So if City Lights took two years to make, it took two years to make. You know, nobody was telling him to hurry up because it was his money. When you stand in the debate that there is a constant debate we have nowadays of people who love all that, 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 that era about Chaplin and Keaton, mm. I mm. mean, there's this intellectual debate goes on, isn't there? That's yes, it's a bit of a nonsense, really. It's a, it's a bit like sort of what do you prefer, oxygen or water. I mean, they're both, you know, they're, they're both pretty good. Um, the thing I think about Chaplin and Keaton, you don't have to prefer one over the other. You, if you look at it in historical uh, perspective, and Charlie was making films long before Buster, and Charlie really, his genius was to raise the standard of the comedy film. When everybody else was chucking bricks at each other, he started to develop character and story and, and actually create a situation on the screen where actually moved people and, and, and made people feel emotion. And that was a pretty good trick for just a black and white silent image to be able to do that. You also say in the book that you, what attracted you to that kind of uh, uh, comedy was that uh, people laugh because people got a good kick up the arse. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, that's silly, but it's good, isn't it? It is funny too. It is. It? It's still funny. Yeah, children love watching adults falling over, for example. Yes. And one adult kicking another adult up, up the arse with a child is heaven. Because they, <laughs> they think that adults are meant to be sort of like fairly straight laced individuals saying, now you must eat all your peas. But suddenly you see Chaplin coming on and just kick somebody up the arse. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hilarious. You know. It's funny you're talking about. Yeah. It. And it's always, it's always a world motivation. There's always a good motivation behind the kick up the arse. It's That's never, right. It's never an innocent arse that gets kicked. No, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, let's, well, let's, let's, we're going to illustrate now a couple mm. of points. We're gonna, the arse kicking, we're going to. Yes, first of all, okay. And then we're going to see one of the most famous scenes of all in all silent comedy, mm. and that's Keaton and the, the house. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Let's have a look at this now. Thank <laughs> you. 